Hi, I'm Emily. Welcome to episode 5 of Holding the Sticks, a hockey-themed fiber arts podcast. Welcome to my craft room here in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Like I said, my name is Emily. You can find me on Ravelry as Shanti Dragon and on Plurk and Twitter as Emily3022. This is a week of happy things, so I'm really excited to do the show this week. <laughs> First of all, today is my little sister Laura's 24th birthday. Happy birthday, Laura! I know she likes to watch the podcast sometimes. So I hope that you're having a wonderful birthday. By the time you watch this, it may be the day after your birthday. But I hope it's wonderful, and I hope now that you're 24, I can still call you kiddo, because that's what I've always called you, and I always will. (laughs) Unless you tell me to stop, and then I will. (laughs) The second happy thing for this week is that the NHL lockout is over! Woohoo! You can see my Hurricanes jersey hanging back here. And just to be clear that I am not abandoning my Charlotte Checkers. I am wearing my Charlotte Checkers jersey today. They won a game yesterday. Played at the PNC Arena, home of the Carolina Hurricanes. Awesome game from what I hear. We'll talk more about that in the third period. <laughs> and more about the lockout coming to the to an end, of course. The third happy thing that happened this week is my application was accepted at blip.tv. Woo! Yay! <laughs> now, I do have to ask for your patience. It's going to take me a couple of days to really learn my way around and get myself up on iTunes. So... Um, Just give me a couple days to figure everything out. For today's episode, I'm just going to post it as usual and then go in to blip and try and figure out how to get all of that set up. So, yay! (laughs) I like happy weeks. Have a couple of thank yous also this week. I wanted to thank all of you who are participating in my Ravelry group. Um, We're having some good discussions going on right there about the end of the lockout and some other things, and I'm just having so much fun in there. And thank you all for joining in and being active members there. Or even if you're just reading along, that's fine too. (laughs) I'm just thankful that anybody watches me at all, so. (laughs) My other thank you is to Holly of the Sheepish Podcast, who gave me a shout out last week. And um, she also has a hockey-themed fiber arts podcast, and hers actually started before mine. I checked with her before I started recording to make sure she would be okay with that. Um, I'd been planning this for quite a while, and great minds think a lot, think alike, as you all know. (laughs) So, I know that um, she hasn't talked a lot of hockey in her podcast, but I bet now that her Washington Capitals are back that she will be um, visiting that topic more than she has been, so... Yay! Go check her out. She's pretty cool. I enjoy her podcast. So, with that, let's get this show underway. Alright, welcome to the first period in the zone where I will talk about my fiber arts projects. I've been pretty busy this week. I haven't finished very much, but I've got a lot on the needles. So, let's get right into it. First of all, in developing play, those are my works in progress, I have been continuing to work on my beekeeper's quilt. And that's designed by Tiny Owl Knits. Um, I'm using a US size 4 or 3.5 millimeter needle for that project and all kinds of sock yarn scraps from projects that I've done in the past and a few that have been sent to me by friends. So. Um, This week I only finished one hexi puff, as they call them, or honeycomb, as the pattern calls them. 
Sorry about that. My eyes are watering. And here's my little honeycomb. It's in the Miss Babs um, yummy sock. It's a little off kilter. I may have um, missed an increase or something in there. <laughs> I think it'll be all right in the end though. But this is done in the French Marigold colorway, which is just a gorgeous Miss Babs colorway. Um, I have another one on the needles at the moment and it's with hand spun, leftover hand spun from a shawl I did, but I left that bag at work. So I was kind of bummed about that, but you know how it goes. <laughs> I'll show it next week. The second project that I have on the needles is uh, my knit sampler afghan. As you all know, one of my goals for 2013 is to knit a blanket. So I joined in with Apple Blossom SF, or Sarah, on Ravelry. She hosts the Apple Blossom and You podcast, and she's having a blanket knit along. Um, originally, she had planned to do the Great American, or the Great Aaron Afghan knit along, but that book has gone out of print and isn't available, so I had to go and find a different pattern to use. So I did some research on Ravelry, and I found the Knit Sampler Afghan by Coates and Clark. Those are the makers of Red Heart. Um, I am actually using Red Heart's, um, Red Heart Soft yarn for that project. And I actually really like that yarn a lot. It's very soft and easy to work with. Using size 7s, um, I'm sorry, I'm using a size 8 on that or 5 millimeter needle. It's just what the pattern calls for. And I have finished one square. This is square number one, basket weave. Hopefully you can see that pretty well. It looks like you can. That's in a navy blue color. And I am in the middle of working on the second square. Let's see if we can pick this up without disturbing too much. It's got all kinds of strands hanging off of it. This is square number two. And that main color there is teal. And the stripe on the bottom, or the stripes on the bottom, are grape. And then the pink is called berry. So I believe that's all four colors. Yes, that's all four colors that will be in the afghan when it's finished. It's a smaller afghan. I think the finished dimensions are like 30 by 40. So I'm actually going to make it double sized in order to, uh, the knit along, it's, you're supposed to do two squares every month. So I will do two squares every month and have a double sized afghan in the end, I hope. And that may wind up being a gift or I might wind up keeping it because I'm kind of in love with those colors, so <laughs> that's actually been a lot of fun. I've been working on that while um, waiting for swatches to dry uh, or block and dry for my Mork sweater, which is my third project on the needles. When it's finished, Mork will look like this. And I just love the pattern, and I'm really excited to cast on after I finish recording today. I have finished swatching, so I now know that I'm going to need to go down a needle size. Pattern calls for a U.S. size 7. I'm going to be using a U.S. size 6 or 4 millimeter needle. I'll show you my swatches real quick. This was the first swatch I did, and it came out a little big. So I did another swatch. I feel feel so fancy and like like such a good kid because I actually did my swatches and washed them and let them dry and I've been very patient through this whole process. I'm not usually that way. <laughs> so this is the swatch that actually worked out. It still has a really nice drape, but it's a tighter knit, which is good because this is um, Barocco Alpaca um, Ultra. Barocco Ultra Alpaca is the name of this yarn. It's about 50% wool, 50% alpaca, and um, as you know, or as you may or may not know, alpaca is a fiber that will grow a lot and doesn't have any memory. When you block wool, when you get wool wet, it will spring back to its original size and shape. Alpaca is not that way. It just kind of grows and grows and grows and gets bigger. So it's better to knit alpaca at a tighter gauge to keep that growing factor at, at a minimum. So I'm kind of glad that I had to go down a needle size on this. So that's it for my works in progress. 
on to She Shoots, She Scores! Woo! All right, I have one finished project this week and I'm pretty excited. I finished my Fair Isle Mittens. This is a Peyton's pattern. But I used Red Heart Super Saver in white and Vanna's Choice in the scarlet color. So here they are. You get them all looking, looking good here. There's the front. There's the back. I love them. <laughs> I thought I would need to steam block these, but actually a trip through the washer and dryer seemed to straighten them out pretty well, as much as they're going to be straightened out. This is my first finished, uh, real intricate color work project. So I was a little tight on my knitting. My floats are a little tight, so you can see, you might be able to see where the red is kind of obscuring the white in some places just because um, my floats were too tight and it's pulling those white stitches back into the mitten. So, um, but overall I'm very happy with these. And just so you all know, these are magic mittens. I finished these early in the week. My Charlotte Checkers were on a losing streak. Five games in a row they had lost. And I thought, you know, I'll put these mittens away and wait until I go to a hockey game. I was supposed to go to one yesterday. Didn't happen. I'll talk more about that later. I'll wait till I go to the hockey game to wear these mittens. But then it was really cold Friday morning. So I put the mittens on. <laughs> and that night, my checkers won. Thanks to the magic mittens. <laughs> Don't you know? And then, Saturday night, after I had worn the mittens again... The lockout ended. So these are epically magic mittens, just so y'all know. Of course, you know, I can try and take the credit for ending the lockout and all of that, but then y'all might get mad at me for not finishing these sooner. <laughs> so I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> but those are done. I'm super happy with them. Did those on a size C, a size 5 needle. I thought I was using a 6, but they were 5s when I measured them. So... Those worked out well. And I think I might try even more color work here in the future. I hope my voice isn't getting too loud when I lean forward like that. I need to be more mindful of that. So, all right, let's get into a new little segment here in the first period. This won't be making an appearance very often, I don't think, but um, occasionally I do purchase yarn. So we're gonna call this the equipment room. Now, the equipment room, obviously, in hockey is where the guys get their sticks and their hockey tape and their uh, pads and their gear. So, my equipment room is where I will get my yarn and my needles and I'll show you different things that I come across. Um, I may do some reviews in the future here, I'm not sure. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But I, um, if you remember last podcast, I was recording happily along, or maybe not so happily, <laughs> And the mail lady came and brought me some yarn that I had ordered from Webs. So I'm going to show you that today, just like I promised that I would. So the first yarn that I received was the Barocco Ultra Alpaca. It's a worsted weight yarn from, um, from Barocco, obviously. And I ordered that in the Redwood Mix colorway. It's number 6281 if you're ordering. I know a lot of different websites will put different color names, but the, but the number is always the same ordered seven of these skeins to knit and work with. On the website, I thought it looked a lot more brown than this, but when it arrived, I absolutely love this color. So I'm happy. I'm really happy with it, even though it's really not what I was expecting. Uh, gee, I wonder why I like red so much. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but here it is. I hope you can see that this is like a heathered yarn. You can see it in the swatch that I did for Mork, but even better, I think. It gives it a real depth of color that I just love. And it's super soft. It may have a little bit of prickle factor against the neck, but with the style of sweater that Mork is, I will probably always wear an undershirt with it anyway. Um, and I have a pretty high tolerance for the prickle. So, really happy with this. The other yarn I ordered was for um, the Argonath stole, and that looks like this.
and I ordered Barocco Vintage DK for that. Um, I may change my mind on, I may use this yarn for something different because it is machine washable and that project really doesn't need to be machine washable. Um, and also this, I had to order a sweater's quantity of this to have enough to make that stall. So we'll see. Um, having just seen The Hobbits, um, I'm really eager to cast on Argonath, but I want to get well in some work before I do that. Anyway, here it is. Isn't that gorgeous? I absolutely am in love. And this also is kind of a heathered color. It's a DK weight. The color name is Fennel. Let's see if it has a number on here. That's color number 2175. You get it even closer there. I it just it's it just pops at me, and I am in love, absolutely. Green is one of my very favorite colors, so it looks elvish to me, which I love me some elves. <laughs> but as for right now, um, this is for Argonath. We'll see if it's if that sings to me when I'm ready to cast on. And the other little bit of yarn that I got was to knit PB the polar bear. He'll look like this when he's done. And I decided I would go all out and treat myself with uh, my Christmas money. And I bought, I thought it was uh, Angora blend, but I actually bought 100% Angora yarn to knit PB with. We'll see how that turns out. I really hope I wind up with enough yardage. This is a worsted weight. Here it is. It's Plymouth Yarns Angora. And it's just in white. Let's bring it back here. Boy, that's really shining bright, isn't it? <laughs> it's very fuzzy, as Angora tends to be. So he will be a very, very soft polar bear. If I can get him, um, if I can, if I have enough yardage here to finish, I really hope I do. If I don't, I'm gonna have to order more, because this is y'all incredibly soft. Y'all wouldn't even believe it. It's super light, feather light, so that should be really fun. I'm looking forward to casting him on as well. That's it for the second period. Let's get into the. I'm sorry. That's it for the first period. Let's get into the second period. All right, let's get into the second period, the training room. It's going to be a little short this week. I just wanted to talk about fitness this week a little tiny bit. As you all know um, who follow me on Ravelry, fitness has been a little bit of a slog for me lately. I've been doing it, especially in the last week. I've gotten right back on the bandwagon. I have not been able to run, so I have been on this stationary bike um, almost every night this week, 30 minutes at a time. It's really boring. I'm not a fan, as you all know, of the stationary bike. Um, it, I'm hearing that the weather is going to warm a little bit, and I might get out and run some in the coming week. I hope, I hope, I hope. Um, but it's been long enough now since I've run that I'm afraid to just jump right back in. I feel like I need to build up again before I start running three miles at a time again. So we'll see how that happens. But anyway, what I have decided to make this less of a slog through the winter months is that I am going to run or bike to Rivendell. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, I found a really cool website. It's called aowinschallenge.net. Let me make sure I said that right. It's aowinschallenge.net. Aowen was a character in The Lord of the Rings, and um, she's awesome. If you haven't seen those movies, highly recommend them. Especially if you like fantasy. If fantasy is not your thing, you may not enjoy it as much. But AonChallenge.net has several different plans for tracking your walking progress as if you are um, the nine walkers going on the quest for to destroy the ring. So the first one is from Hobbiton to Rivendell. And so I'm going to do that one. It is 458 miles from Hobbiton to Rivendell. So I'm assuming this is going to take me quite a while to finish. Um, the way I'm going to do it is when I run, those miles that I run will count one for one. When I ride on my stationary bike, I have no way to track the mileage there. But I'm going to count 30 minutes on the bike as one mile. And I know that's very low. Um, I'm probably going 
a lot more miles than one if I'm on the bike for 30 minutes, but um, I don't want to be encouraged to use the bike instead of running because of getting there faster. So that's the way I'm going to do it. And I will put that website in my show notes so that y'all can find it if you're interested in doing that along with me. So that's it for the second period. Let's get on into the third. Okay, it's time to drop the puck for the third period and a little bit of hockey talk. Might be a little more than a little bit of hockey talk today. I've got a lot going on, so, and I don't want to skimp on the Hockey 101 segment either. So, um, my trip to Raleigh to watch the Checkers play at PNC Arena was canceled. I was supposed to go to that game. I had mentioned it on last week's episode. Well, my mom came down with what may well have been the flu, and um, she caught it from my nephew after Christmas. If y'all follow me on Plurk, you know he was a pretty sick little boy over Christmas. Poor kid. Mom caught it, not as bad as Banyan had it, but um, she was pretty sick and she just wasn't feeling up to going to the game. We were supposed to go with her. She lives in Raleigh. <clears throat> Excuse me. And because as a massage therapist, I don't get sick days, at least not yet. Once I've been where I work for a year, I'll have a little bit of vacation time available to me that I can probably use for sick time. But at this point, I don't have any sick days. We decided it would be best to avoid mom's house for the time being so that Fox and I, my husband and I, wouldn't catch this horrible cold or flu or whatever it was. So we decided not to go, and of course... As you all know, on Saturday night, the lockout ended. Actually, it was very early Sunday morning. I understand they came to the agreement about 4.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. So <laughs> so I woke up on Sunday, and um, it was kind of funny because I keep my phone right by my bed. I use it as my alarm clock. So on the weekends, I'll just kind of slowly wake up and pick up my phone and check Twitter and sometimes Plurk, Facebook, that kind of thing. And I did that, and I saw that the lockout was over, and my first reaction kind of surprised me. I was grouchy about it. <laughs> I thought, well, they finally came to an agreement. Why couldn't they have done that back in August? And I didn't believe it at first. And I'm still a little bit, you know, I'm just waiting for it all to fall apart again. But um, even the hockey media that I really trust are treating it as if the lockout is over. Um, Bob McKenzie is kind of my yardstick for that. If he says something is true, I believe him because he never jumps on the bandwagon to report news that hasn't been confirmed. So <laughs> once Bob McKenzie started tweeting as if the lockout was over, then I said, okay, maybe it really is for real over. But I was pretty grouchy about it at first, and it took me a while and a cup of tea and my breakfast before I started to get excited that I'm going to see Cam Ward in net again. He's my favorite Carolina Hurricane. He's the goalie, our starting goalie. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is um, his jersey, actually. He's number 30. 30 is a traditional goalie number, so... So excited. I can't wait to see him play again. Um, we've got... Jordan Stahl on the team this year. We have Jared playing for our minor league team. And of course, Eric Stahl has been on our team um, for many years and is our captain. So we have three of the Stahl brothers. We're just trying to get Mark in the fold now. If you're a Rangers fan, don't hate me. <laughs> we Hurricanes fans love our Stahl brothers. <laughs> but anyway, we're so excited that we're going to see some hockey. Um, what I'm reading and seeing right now on Twitter is that they are expecting to have a 48-game season. Typically, a hockey season is 85 games around that. And so that's a little more than half of the games that would usually be played. <clears throat> They're going to start that on January the 19th. Excuse me, I'm sorry I keep clearing my throat. But what I'm hearing is a start, get, start date of January the 19th. I'm so looking forward to it. Now, as I said in the beginning, this does not mean I will abandon my checkers. Um, I have been a Charlotte Checkers fan for the last couple of years. They've only been in Charlotte for a couple of years. Before that, um, they were in Albany, New York, and were called the Albany, Albany River Rats. But since they have been the Charlotte Checkers, I have followed them closely. 
I am known to um, have the checkers game on the radio or on internet radio really and the Carolina Hurricanes game on my TV at the same time so <laughs> and thinking of that let me let me put this little picture in here of me during the playoffs last year And that's me, the crazy hockey lady. That's not me, but that's my view from my chair during the playoffs last year. So all of those screens up. I had two computer screens with a game on each, and the television was on with a game on that, and I was also listening to a Checkers game on the radio that night. So <laughs> that's me. It gets a little crazy at my house during hockey season sometimes. <clears throat> it's been a little bit of, it's been kind of nice the last several months not to have to um, divide my attention that way, but I don't mind. I enjoy it. <laughs> so let's see, the lockout is over. Um, of course I'm worried about what this will do to the checkers. We're going to obviously lose a couple of guys from the lineup who will head up to Raleigh to play with the Hurricanes. Justin Falk is almost um, a shoe-in for that. I can't imagine he would be back in Charlotte. Um, one of our goalies will be backing up Cam Ward, I would assume, unless Brian Boucher comes back, and that will stir things up, mix things up. I don't know um, what the goalie situation will be in Charlotte if that happens. Um, we've got J Drayson Bowman, um, who was playing pretty regularly with the Canes last season. He may be leaving us. Um, Zach Boychuk, Zach Dalpy, um, Brett Sutter are all names I've heard being tossed around to join the big team this year. So we'll see how training camp goes. I'm hearing that's going to start Saturday or Sunday. So we'll see who makes the cut and then go from there. So I'm excited about that. So for Hockey 101 this week, I thought that I would explain the rink and the layout and what all of those lines and circles and dots are that you see on a hockey rink. So I have this diagram here. Hopefully you can see that okay. Let's see here. My light changed since I did the test for this. There we go. That works pretty well. So that is a diagram of a, of a hockey rink. Um, today I'm going to talk about just the North American hockey rink. Um, of course, last week, just for a quick review, I talked about the types of players on the ice that they're for each team. At any given time on the ice, there will be one goalie, two defensemen, and three forwards. So this week it'll be all about this ice rink. So we'll start with the center line. That's this line right here. Hopefully you can see that. Let's see here. <laughs> yeah, you can see that pretty well. That is the center line, also known as the red line. It divides the rink in half, as you can see. It's used in um, judging icing calls. So, and I'll talk more about icing when I talk about um, penalties and other reasons that play will stop in a hockey game. So that's the center line, divides the rink in two. And the other, the next thing is the two blue lines. That's those two lines right here. Making sure you can still see that. Yep, these are the two blue lines right here. Those divide the rink into three zones. So, one, two, three zones. The, between the two blue lines, that's the neutral zone. We're going to, for the sake of this segment, say that play is going from this way to this way. That's from my right to my left. So, let's say that play is going this way. So, this would be the attacking zone. And this would be the defending zone. And when I say that the play is going this way, that means that this team right here is the team I'm focusing on. They've got their goalie in the net right here, and they're trying to score goals on this net. I hope that makes sense. So, got the defending zone, the neutral zone, and the attacking zone. The next line is the goal line. It's this little thin red line at each end right here. The goal line has two functions. 
And one of them is also to help judge that icing call I was talking about earlier. And the other is obviously to judge a goal. To score a goal, this is the little, this little part right here. Let's see if I can get closer. <laughs> to be able to see this tiny little thing right there. That, that represents the actual goal itself, the net. And in order for a goal to count, the puck has to completely cross that little red line within the goal, obviously. So the puck can't be partway in. It can't, cannot be still touching that red line. It has to be completely over the red line to count as a goal. So that is the purpose of the goal line. There are nine face-off spots in this hockey rink. So you'll see there's kind of five main ones. One here, 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 and here. This is where the game starts, right in the middle of the ice there. Um, these two um, circles with the hash marks in them are the other more common spots for face-offs to be held. After play stops, they have to start the play again somehow, so the, the referee will or a linesman will come and drop the puck on one of these dots. And these hash marks help the players know how they're supposed to line up and um, position themselves around during the face-off. So we've got those five main ones, and then there's one here, 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 and here. And there's different reasons why face-off would be in a different spot. Depending on why play was stopped in the first place, they will decide which of these spots the face-offs will happen at. So... Um, the goal area, we'll go back to this little little tiny area here. Talk more about this little area because there's all kinds of little lines on that area. <laughs> In the goal area you've got the crease, which is this kind of almost semicircle looking thing. In international play it is a semicircle, but in the North American play we have it, it's kind of straight lines and then a, a arched end there. The crease is kind of like the goalie's safe zone. The rule is that if a, and if, if I'm sorry, the um, attacking player, if an attacking player's stick, body part, um, or skate crosses into that crease before the puck does, then any goal scored will not count. So this area here helps the goalie be able to do his job without being interfered with, basically. Now, obviously, the players that are trying to score the goals will come into that crease after the puck because that's just a follow-through to score the goal. So um, that's what the crease is right there. It's usually a blue, they call it the blue paint. It's a blue semicircle-ish thing in front of the goal. Um, behind the goal, you'll see this funny-looking area here that's called the goalie trap or trapezoid. I most commonly hear it called the trapezoid. That is the only area behind the goal line. Remember, this is the goal line, this red thin line there. That is the only area behind the goal line that it's legal for the goalie to play the puck. So the goalie can play the puck wherever he wants um, in front of the goal as long as he's not crossed over into, you know, the this area here. But... Um, the only place you can play it behind the net is here. And they, I guess they did that rule back in 05, 04, 05. They um, made that rule because there were a couple of goalies that were really, really good at playing the puck um, behind the net. And it was kind of making for a, a slower game, from what I understand. So I know Marty Brodeur was one of those um, goalies that was really good at handling the puck back there. So that is the trapezoid. The only other area here that I haven't talked about is this little, hopefully you can see, yeah, there you go, this little semicircle right there. That is known as the referee's crease. Now this little 10 foot diameter half circle is where the referees can confer with one another and with the scorekeeper, and that is actually located right in front of the scorekeeper's bench. Um, and the players are not allowed to come into that little half circle. If they do, if a player crosses into this while they're conferring, then um, they can be assessed a game misconduct or a 10-minute misconduct penalty. Um, 
the literature that I was reading just said in misconduct, so I'm not sure if it would be a game misconduct or a 10 minute one. But um, there you go. That is the anatomy of an ice hockey rink. <laughs> So if y'all have any questions, just let me know. I know I actually learned a few things while I was researching that for you, so that's pretty cool. I like to learn new things and increase my knowledge of the game. So, all right, that's it for the third period. Let's get into some post-game chatter. Okay, welcome to the post-game chatter have my cup of tea today. It's still even warm. <laughs> Didn't drink it all, so that tells you I've had a much easier recording session today than I did last week. In my teacup today I have some cranberry, raspberry, and elderflower. This is uh, more of the Christmas tea that Fox brought me back from Cincinnati. It's a Twinings infusion, so I love it. It's so, so delicious. I'm going to try this soon with just a little touch of honey or sugar in it. It's delicious on its own, but I think that would really make the sweetness pop. Um, just with a touch, not a whole lot or anything. So that's what I'm drinking today. Yesterday was Epiphany, and that is traditionally the dates on the Christian calendar where um, the wise men arrive at the nativity scene, or at the nativity and they bring their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the Christ child. So I always like to celebrate Epiphany. I finally moved my little wise men figures up around the nativity scene. And here's a little picture of that. And I always light a candle on those special days. So for me, I usually celebrate Epiphany by thinking about the gifts that I have and how um, I would like to offer those gifts to be used for good in the coming year. So that's just something I like to do. I'd love to hear if any of you celebrate Epiphany or if you have a similar holiday that where you like to think about how you can do more good in the coming year with the gifts that you've been given. So I always like to hear what other people do as well. Yesterday we also went and um, since we couldn't go to the hockey game in Raleigh, we decided we would go watch The Hobbit in 3D. <laughs> I am such a huge Lord of the Rings fan and um, I'm surprised I lasted this long without seeing it, but we just haven't had the time. We had the opportunity yesterday so we jumped on it, went to a matinee, and I enjoyed it so much. Um, I just kind of geek out and lose myself in that whole fantasy world there. I love Tolkien, the books, and I love the movies, and um, The Hobbit was no exception. Now there were a couple of changes made from canon, um, that you know, from the books to the movie that maybe weren't necessary, but it's a movie and they always do that, so I try not to let it bother me too much because <laughs> I know what really happened because <laughs> I've read the books. And speaking of which, I thought it was really interesting. Um, now, it's been a little while since I've read The Hobbit, but I don't remember Radagast the Brown being in that book in The Hobbit, and they stuck him in there in the first movie. I hope this isn't counting as a spoiler alert, because I'm not telling you what happened or anything, but um, they have put Radagast in, and I'm wondering, it'll be interesting to see in the second movie for The Hobbit if Radagast is kind of a replacement for Bjorn. And if you're familiar with the story, then you'll know who I'm talking about. Because um, I don't remember him being in the book, so I thought it was pretty cool how they stuck him in there, though. And other than that, the movie, the cinematography was incredible, as usual. It's Peter Jackson. What do you expect? Um, the effects were amazing. A little bit over the top from time to time. Um, some of the things that the dwarves survived was, you know, you, you're watching these things happen and you're going, there's no way. That's just, you got, you, I guess you have to suspend disbelief a little bit in order to really believe what's going on in the, on the screen. But like I said, it's a movie. Now, if you're a big Lord of the Rings fan, if you enjoyed the first, um, the trilogy of movies that was out, this is more of a children's story, I think. I mean, there's a lot of fighting and, and blood and gore. You don't want to bring a young child to see it um, unsupervised or, you know, if they're easily frightened. 
but it had more of, of the feeling of a fairy tale, I guess, than the first three. The first three were very serious, and this one had a little bit more of a lighter tone to it, so I enjoyed that, too. And just for my little um, favorite parts, I know when they showed the Woodland King Thranduil on the elk, riding the elk with his army behind him, I just kind of geeked out a little bit. I had to grab my husband. I was so excited. That was so cool. <laughs> I loved it. And then, of course, seeing Lord Elrond um, in action on horseback riding and um, fighting, that was too cool. I, I love elves. I always like to fancy in my mind that that if I were in Middle Earth, I would be an elf, when in reality, I would probably either be a hobbit or a dwarf, <laughs> because I, I'm i very hobbity, and I'm um, short and hairy and <laughs> dwarfish, so <laughs> there's nothing wrong with hobbits or dwarfs, but I do love the elves. I used to write uh, Lord of the Rings fan fiction, so... Um, I always wrote my main character was always an elf in those when I did that. <laughs> True confessions. I really want to go to Rivendell, but... Unfortunately, I'm afraid that will never happen in real life. <laughs> Other than that, um, not much else going on this week. Work has been just fine. Um, real busy, that's a good thing. So my hands have been a little tired. I've had to be careful with what kinds of projects I knit. And other than that, though, um, that's about it for this week. So until next time, I hope that your projects and your favorite hockey teams, including the NHL ones, stay out of the penalty box. Bye-bye.